Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Here today with uh, Jason Granite. He's been on before. He had contacted me, and we were thinking we were going to talk about uh, potential regulation in the industry and other kinds of quasi gambling type issues for games of chance or games of skill. But we wound up talking about a, a range of things. This episode, I've titled it Disincentives to Sell because uh, we're, it's a very interesting hobby part of the charm of the hobby that sometimes you don't want to sell and you're rewarded for not selling. So thanks, Jason. Thanks uh, other uh, listeners who've uh, contributed over these uh, couple of years of doing this. It's been a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, CompC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins Scott Auctions, and Tops Panini and Upper Deck. So here's the conversation. Dealers promote and sell what they have. They have cards that are really good cards, but the greatest cards are going to auction and they're getting put away. When it's a world record price, you're not necessarily trying to flip it the next week. <laughs> you yeah. might want to show it, but you know, I'm not flipping it. Yeah. I'm finding that to be the case with wax as well. Lots of dealers and lots of places where maybe all the wax isn't coming out. They're putting out what they can and they're stashing the stuff that they're not. What's interesting about what's happening with Fanatics is that the distribution mechanism is going to change because I find that the dealers who have the distribution agreements with the companies now are both in the moving business and the storage business, whereas Fanatics is just in the moving business. They might be in the storage business, whereas you and I could store our cards there, but they're not going to be in the storage business, i.e. put a case in the back of the shop and wait to see if it's worth more next year. I think they're going to be in the pure moving business which is going to change the access for all these products for people. It could. There's been a perception for a long time. It, it hasn't been true every year, but in many years of this hobby, of my experience, most years, in fact, there's a perception that your inventory increases. And that's not true of any other thing that Fanatics does, I don't think. Now, it's probably been true in some of the sneaker kinds of things that uh, vintage, there's some appreciation of your inventory instead of depreciation. It's a great problem to have. But it's tough to be a retailer or a distributor when you have a disincentive to selling something faster. The slower you sell it, the more you make. It's just counterintuitive. They're trying to have inventory turns, but most of their stuff is commoditized. Yeah, if you think about it like Wall Street, right? Because I, I work on Wall Street and it's hard not to draw parallels in life. And if you think about a broker dealer on Wall Street is just trying to move bonds, move stocks and get it in the hands of the investors and the owners from the issuers. But there was a period, obviously, before the original financial crisis, where banks and dealers were building up big inventory positions because it was only going up, just like we are with the cards. And then there was a spectacular finish that ended in lots of oversight, lots of regulation, lots of change on Wall Street. On some level, the fanatics move might have a little symmetry to that because the card companies or the people that produce the cards, which are the athletes and the leagues and the people that are at the beginning of the food chain, whereas the, the collector was at the other end of the food chain, there were clogs in the pipes from one to the other. And Fanatic said, we have a chance to clear all those clogs in the pipes and they can give a bigger share to the people at the beginning and get the cards to the people at the end. And so I think the people on both ends of the chain are going to feel good about that. People in the middle are going to be the ones who feel stretched through that transition. They, they could be disintermediate. I mean, they, they really could be. Uh, what, what I see is that with NFTs and blockchain, you have the ability to know the chain of custody. It's very possible to me that when Fanatics comes in and controls so many links in the whole pipeline, they want to participate in all of that. There's probably technology where they could know that if they transact a case of a product, to a distributor, to a dealer, to a store, to an individual, wherever, that could be uniquely identified. And they could know if distributors were holding on to them or moving them through. Again, it'd have to be a kind of poor man's blockchain. They'd have to have some way there'd be some registration. If they knew they were giving a distributor 100 cases of something and only 90 of them found their way into the market, I think if 90% of the stuff's getting distributed, I'm not going to quibble over 10% being put back for investment. But if it's the other way around, if it's 30, 40, 50% being put back, and fanatics potentially, I think, by serially, by uniquely numbering these boxes and providing some incentive for reporting when it changes hands, that's a little bit of a big brother thing. 
But on the other hand, if it means that product is moving and not being stored, storage, I think, is not great. That's a contrived scarcity in our market, not good in the long run. These are collectibles because they were intended to be enjoyed contemporaneously. And uh, the fact that there was an occasional one put back, like these toys or video games that were never taken out of the wrapper. So it's possible that fanatics will find if they can control enough of the links in the chain to know which distributors are playing games or which LCSs are, are really not putting it through into their store because they'll know when they get sold. And if somebody's selling something, they'll know perhaps which case was sold. And the contact tracing. <laughs> Look, the world has changed with respect to contact tracing for sure over the last two years. So the, the amount of technology and the amount of things out there, and if anyone is forward thinking it's a company like Fanatics, they they live in tomorrow, not in yesterday, that they're going to be willing to, at a minimum, take chances to figure that all out. I remember when Bloomberg Terminal came, it was very forward thinking on Wall Street, but you can't access your Bloomberg without giving your fingerprint every day. That creates a whole different level of security and tracking and use. And that's just information. That's not even assets. I, I found that over the last few years, the amount of money that some of these things have been worth, the HBO story had the IRS walking around and uh, John Frankel was walking with him. It just showed me like, if that's what they're putting on TV, then what else is happening behind and around and the watching? And so the amount of money is just shocking. I was walking through a card show this weekend with an about to be 12 year old and it's hundreds of dollars, one item after another. And to me, that just calls for more eyeballs, more watching, more thoughtfulness. By the way, as an invest, as a collector, as a participant in the market, I welcome that. I like feeling safe in, in the markets I operate in. But you and I both know there are people who have benefited from the lack of safety and all those shades of gray that have existed. And I welcome it as an investor, but I think that the market has to be, has their eyes open that those shades of gray are likely to get cleared up over time, especially as fanatics comes in or others as the market evolves. And because of the amount of money that's in the game and people well, who participate should feel comfortable they're getting the right protection. The cousin of regulation and the way it's very likely to come in or encroach more is taxation. When you're looking at all these numbers, it could be that it's just the IRS they're seeing because we try to figure out how big is the size of the industry. And it, you can't just figure out, well, here's the value of the cards, because I think Fanatics play is going to be not just on the original, the primary market, the when it's originally sold. The exciting thing about a card show is that there are cards that change hands several times within the show. Some kid's going around, he sells one thing, buys another, then he sells that, buys another. And so there's some churning there. But every one of those transactions is a taxable event. So it's not just that this card went up because that's an unrealized capital gain if you held it. I think Brian Gumble, that was his initial reaction at the end of the interview. And there's and money I being made. And, and again, Fanatics, I think, wants to participate in the secondary market, because when you're buying the card, like in the old days, you'd buy a card, the cards were a penny, but then you sell it for $100, that's a $99.99 gain. I think Fanatics is going to want to participate in the secondary, tertiary, every down the line sale of that. And that's what could get the IRS interested. And that's frankly, Jason, that I think that's difficult to regulate that. The, the regulation that I would not be against is regulation that makes it difficult for crook to operate in our industry, that there's some enforcement of the laws we already have, as yeah. well as any scams. But regulation that ties one hand behind the back of everybody, I'm really not usually, I'm not quite libertarian, but I, I don't want to see that. But no, some I, I, some I, of the, I, we were talking about gambling in the context of a game of chance rather than a game of skill. I think people should always be moving, and I don't call it gambling if it's skill. As much. It's gambling in the sense you don't know what the outcome is going to be, but you have a good chance if there's some skill involved and you don't overestimate the skill <laughs> that you think you have because you don't know if something's going to go up or down. The only people that it's not a gamble are the breakers because they've done the math. And if they sell this many spots, they're guaranteed to make money. Now, somebody in the break could make big bucks if they get the, the huge uh, whale and others could lose. Again, if they're not providing 
uh, positive expected value and still making money for this, it doesn't work. So I think some of those things self-regulate themselves. I think they self look, there's different versions. If you have a $10 pack of cards, you offer 10 people, $1 chance, equal value, roll the dice, no skill, all chance. The other place that exists in our society, lottery tickets, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, otherwise, there's very heavy government participation. One of the reasons why the fan duels and all these companies aren't in every state is because the governments are still working through the right way to figure the economics out. So sometimes these things look like that. Like it's a $10 pack. You have, it doesn't matter what's in it or not. I could go into the store and buy it for $10. Me, you and eight other people put a dollar, they roll dice, someone wins. That to me is as the numbers get bigger and bigger on that. And every one of them is recorded and put on the internet. You're introducing yourself to the possibility a break where I have the Knicks, you have the Mavericks. To me, that's spiritually gambling because I might get Patrick Ewing. You can go with Dirk Nowitzki. But that to me feels different than just the straight roll of the dice. Absolutely. The $10, it's the amount of money, Jason. That's what's troubling about uh, some of these uh, newscasters and the headlines is that when you're talking about your $10 example or your $100 example, the IRS is not going to get all excited about that. But we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands in some cases. There's a lot of sympathy in uh, not cracking down on collectors that want to get their Knicks or their Mavs. That almost is like the order of being a hobbyist. You could have a business in selling Knicks. My accountant tells me there's two ways to treat your collecting endeavors, you're buying and selling. If you make money on it, it's reportable income, but it's not a capital gain if it's an ongoing business. It's only a capital gain if this is stuff I bought when I was a kid, now I'm selling it. But if you have an ongoing buying and selling of cards, then it's, and all your inventory is commingled, then it's not capital gain. It's It's a profit and loss from a sole proprietorship or an LLC or however you want to set it up. Again, if you're making 500 bucks a year or less, I don't think anybody's going to bug you. But this is about when you see I know a break happen and someone sell a card for half a million dollars. I know, but there could be an overreaction. And that's what I would have concern about. There's three kinds of gamblers. There's the professional gamblers, the social gamblers, and the problem gamblers. And people are not very self-aware sometimes to either think they're more of a professional than they think when they really have no business, they they don't really have enough skill, uh, or they minimize the fact that they're a problem gambler, that they have some uh, OCD to to want to get that fixed. As long as it's a social gambling kind of thing where you just like the people that buy an occasional lottery ticket. Uh, Yeah, look, my view on this is a lot of times the government or other authorities react to the like lowest common denominator. A lot of the gambling rules exist for the problem gamblers, not for the social gamblers. And so I agree with you. I don't want the hobbyists and the people like me who are having fun with my kids to get dragged down a road with others. That would be a bad outcome for all of us. On the flip side, I think the good story is that we're having these conversations that there's more focus on it, that the hobby, as it's described, that's a business for many, but it's a hobby, has elevated to where these conversations are happening, which to me is a very fascinating it's a better problem to have. To have yeah, totally. So much dynamic price movement that even the scammers are excited about getting involved. But policing is way preferable to federal or even state, any kind of a governmental policing. But people should be innocent until proven guilty. If enough people have a bad experience, they, they shouldn't patronize that person. HBO showed they're looking, they're watching. And there's definitely someone who's thinking about this and thinking about the right way forward. The intersection of this with the grading companies, because the grading companies provide a level of standardization. If you have a Luka Doncic card and I have a Luka Doncic card and we hold them up, all right, but if now I have a 10 and you have a nine or I have a 10 and you have a 10, it's brought some the apples to apples on them. And now those companies gotten so cool, I can go with my phone and scan them and see if they're real and all this, but that also links back to, they can maybe trace them. So it provides a lot of liquidity and a lot of standardization, a lot of things that are very beneficial. And sometimes for me, it just provides protection 